Good afternoon and welcome to our FIMBIS 2030 webinar on greenwashing, avoid, identify and act. For those of you who are not aware, Finance and Business 2030 or FIMBIS 2030 as we like to call it, is an initiative that was founded in 2019 by chartered accountants worldwide and One Young World as a legacy programme for young finance and business leaders who want to work together or individually to tackle UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is becoming increasingly clear that going green is good for business. More and more stakeholders, from investors to board members and regulators to consumers, are asking companies to be low carbon and environmentally friendly. But how can you ensure your organization's environmental statements are accurate and are not susceptible to allegations of greenwashing? In this webinar, we have a truly international expert panel of five speakers because from Ireland, the UK, South Africa, Moldova and Japan, who will help guide you on what greenwashing is and how to avoid it and what you need to do if you suspect it is happening within your organisation. You'll be able to download a useful guide with key takeaways from this session via the QR code, which hopefully should be on the screen now, or by heading over to the Chartered Accountants Worldwide website. Now, it's amazing to see how many people have joined us today. We have over 1,200 attendees online from 62 countries, which is both humbling and exceptional. So thank you and hello. But before we hear from our, our expert speakers, we have some housekeeping notes to run through for you all. For those of you having any issues with bandwidth, you can lower the resolution of the stream on your computer so you can see us better. And there will be polls asked by me, and also on the screen that you'll be able to engage with and the option to post questions later on in Slido on this page that I can then put to our speakers. Please do engage with us because the more interactive the better. Pose those killer questions that I can't think of that you are going to ask and get those questions, get those answers. And we also encourage you to share your favourite quotes or moments from this event on social media and please also do tag us in your posts, we're all on Twitter these days. With that out of the way, we will crack on with the session kicking off with a few introductory words from Michael Itzer, Chairman of Chartered Accountants Worldwide and CEO of the Institute of Chartered Accountants England and Wales. So, Michael, the screen is yours. Um, thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure as Chairman of Chartered Accountants Worldwide and the CEO of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales to welcome you to this FinBiz 2030 webinar about greenwashing and the role of chartered accountants, finance and business professionals. Companies have got a responsibility to provide accurate information to their stakeholders. And we as chartered accountants have a duty to ensure that this information is transparent and honest. It's important that we as chartered accountants are aware of greenwashing and understand our role in identifying, preventing, and reporting on it. The consequences of greenwashing are, as you'll hear later, significant. Not only does it harm the environment, but it also damages the reputation of honest businesses and erodes trust in the market. Furthermore, it can lead to financial losses for investors who rely on accurate information when making investment decisions. So what can we do as finance professionals to prevent greenwashing? Firstly, we need to be aware of the signs of greenwashing. These can include vague and misleading language, unverifiable claims, and the lack of third-party certification. We need to question the information provided by companies and verify their claims through independent research and analysis. Secondly, we need to promote transparency and accuracy in reporting. As chartered accountants, we play a key role in ensuring that financial and non-financial information is reported accurately and transparently. We need to encourage companies to report on their environmental impacts in a clear and honest manner using internationally recognized frameworks and standards. Lastly, we need to report instances of greenwashing when we come across them. This means reporting to regulatory bodies or industry watchdogs when we suspect that a company is engaging in misleading or false advertising. By doing so, 
we can help to hold companies accountable and prevent them from misleading consumers and investors. I'd like to thank our esteemed panel for giving their time today and to you, the audience, for joining us. I hope you'll find this session useful and that it will help you to identify, prevent and report on greenwashing in the future. Thanks, Dan. Back to you. Thank you so much, Mike, Michael. That is, uh, you know, clearly there is a, a, a big role for, for chartered accountants to play uh, in, in, in dealing with identifying, dealing with uh, reporting uh, and really addressing the, the, the subject of, of greenwashing within the companies that they that they are in or that they that they operate with with. with. Um, and I think we're going to be hearing much more about this uh, in today's session. Um, but before we do so, I'd like to uh, uh, quickly hand over to Kate Robertson, who is the co-founder and chief executive of One Young World for some further words of, of welcome. Uh, Kate. To everybody, hello to Finviz all over the world. Um, firstly, a particular thanks to the team at Chartered Accountants Worldwide who are completely amazing. Michael, salute you, all due respect and particular thanks to the amazing Ruth. Thank you so much for all you are doing for the world. And it is for the world. Why do we say that? If we want to make change in the world or we want to do anything of value, it is going to have to be measured. And the people who are going to be doing the measuring are the people on this call. It's going to be the chartered accountants. You'd almost get to a point where you say nothing matters more because to do the things that we value, we will have to measure them. And this comes to greenwashing. It comes to the whole carbon. It's not even debate anymore, the whole crisis. And it's this. What I would say to you as someone who spent far, far too many, well over 30 years in the world of advertising and marketing, greenwashing is a marketing thing. It's a way of saying, look at us, we're doing nice things. What it's come to also do is to mask the bad things. So if you look over here, look over here, it's like a magician, look at my nice things, leave my bad things over there. And that's what we're talking about here. But what I would urge you, as the qualified, highly educated professionals, every single one of you are, is it would urge you where you see greenwashing, call it, but don't get tied up in greenwashing and debating the greenwashing. When you see greenwashing, you call it, you say, I think that's greenwashing, but make sure you ask the next question. And the next question is this. Yeah. If you are, for example, a company that has made its money out of fossil fuels, so let's go straight to the heart of the matter here, and they're talking about their investments in renewables, for which, hallelujah, then you say, hold on, you're greenwashing, but what I would like to know, what percentage of your profits and investments per year are going into renewables, and how are you scaling those up? And are you going to do 50 times more next year? Because that's what the world's hoping you're going to do. And push that end. Let me tell you something, and I know this from personal knowledge, bitter experience. If you're not asking about the better things people are doing and forcing them to quantify and accelerate those from a marketing perspective, they don't have any particular reason to do anything more than they're doing. Because somebody in there, some shareholder, some stakeholder goes, well, you know, we're doing all that stuff. And, you know, the activists and these people, they don't care that we're doing it. So the only arguments that stand are the arguments that only you, the chartered accountants, can make. You can count. You can say you invested $50 billion last year in fossil. You say that you're doing lots for renewable. You've only invested 10 billion. Why isn't that the other way around? And keep pushing it to tell you something else that you need to know about greenwashing. And it's this. We've been through many, many years where all of us have offsetting programs. So we create those much those many emissions, and then we do something that offsets them. 
an industry which fell into some disrepute for good reason, but is still an important thing that you do. Okay, so if somebody says to you, I have to offset a thousand tons and I'm doing it with this scheme, what is the question? The question is an accounting question. In that offsetting, how is carbon priced? Every ton, how is it priced? I learned from a very big activist in the UK four years ago that one of the company schemes that had been given to One World to offset the costs of the summit, one of those schemes was pricing carbon at, at around $12 a ton on the schemes. But the company itself behind that scheme, so one of the big energy guys, in their accounting practices, cost carbon at $42 a ton. So the offsetting is kind of 25% what it needs to be. But the only people who can find out that information is you guys. So I urge you in your professional lives to understand your value to the world. It's beyond price. Nobody else is going to hold greenwashing to account, but it's not the greenwashing itself. It's what goes on behind. It's the numbers. It's not the opinions that matter. It's the numbers. And for this, the world looks to you. So I say from me here in Belfast, wearing the green for a different reason, for me here in Northern Ireland in Belfast to say to all of you, Thank you for every single thing you do in your work, the good that you do in the world, holding all of us, holding business and governments to account. Only you can do this job. So I thank you, all of you. I thank Chartered Accountants Worldwide for this precious community. It's one of the best things we do all year. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart and from all of us at One Young World. And good luck. And back to you, Dan. Thank you so much for those words, uh, Kate. Uh, I'm no mathematician, I'm no accountant, but I think we can all recognize lies when we see them. And you know, these, these lies are incredibly important, aren't they? They're just in, in the sense that there's a there's a you know there's a reputational risk, clearly, there's a there's a regulatory risk, there's a financial risk, but ultimately it's the risk of the environment. If we don't get these things right, you know, the the the, the climate goals will not be achieved if people aren't being uh, uh, held. To, to account on these things, and that's the role, I guess, of, of the of, of the accountant here. So, um, but before we move to our, our next speaker, I'd like uh, to ask you, uh, the audience, uh, a poll question, and, and get some of, get some of your involvement as well at this point. Um, so, uh, hopefully, we'll, we, can get, we can bring the poll question up so you can all see it. Uh, this is using our uh, our, our technology Slido. Um, which I'm sure many of you are, are, are familiar with now. And the question is, is quite simply, which statement uh, reflects most closely your understanding of the term greenwashing? Uh, firstly, you can say, I have heard the term, but not sure what it means. Uh, secondly, uh, greenwashing involves making an unsubstantiated claim about being environmentally friendly. Uh, or the third is, is uh, greenwashing is something that only affects big companies. So please have a look at those. Uh, and uh, and you know and click through on whichever is the most relevant for you. Um, but before we come to the results, and it takes a little bit of time, I want to give you some time just to uh, have a think and, and and respond. And before we come to those results, I should say that the next uh, panelist will shed some more light on what greenwashing is, which is a crucial thing. I don't think there's still a great deal of ignorance and uh, and just a, a, a lack of understanding about what exactly greenwashing uh, comprises. So we're joined now by uh, uh, Yoshi Demoto, who is a sustainability consultant and advisor at GLIN Impact Capital, an ESG impact fund based in Japan. He's passionate about helping corporates find innovative solutions in sustainability and ESG related domains, and hopefully can uh, share some of those thoughts with us today. But before we do so, I'd, I'd like to see if we can get our polling uh, questions up on the screen uh and you know if you look at that that's you know quite quite staggering it's 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 well, i suppose it's not staggering in, in, in a sense that like, you know, what i was saying is 
is in a sense that many people aren't familiar with the term greenwashing. You know, many people aren't, uh, you know, don't lack a sort of basic uh, understanding really or familiarity with the, with the term. And, uh, uh, and, and how deep this goes is, is still really open to question as well, even among people who do think they understand uh, uh, the term. And I think that goes to education and training, something we'll come on later on. But Yoshi, I mean, you're looking at those results that are pre pretty, pretty interesting uh, numbers. And, and I, I guess uh, just if you can start off with a simple explanation of what greenwashing is and what firms, both, both large and small, must do to avoid getting embroiled with it. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction, uh, Dan. Um, so hello again. Uh, my name is Yoshi. I'm a One Young World ambassador. So I've been to the Hague Summit, the Munich Summit, and also the Manchester Summit. So hello to all the One Young World ambassadors who are listening today. And uh, as Dan shared, I'm an ESG sustainability uh, consultant working at Glenn Impact Capital, a real impact ESG investment fund uh, with a value up team that provides sustainability consulting services to corporates in Japan and also around the world. So very, very honored to be here on this panel with these very esteemed uh, guests and happy to share my two cents on this very important topic of greenwashing uh, from my perspective here in uh, Tokyo, Japan. So uh, to answer the question on what is greenwashing, uh, the simple definition that um, I like to use is that um, greenwashing is when a company spends more money on its marketing efforts of acting green rather than being green through its business practices. Um, so I kind of want to also share a little bit of the backdrop or the story behind where this term comes from. So it actually all started from this, from a towel um, in, in from a hotel in Fiji. So I'm sure that many of you have stayed in hotels where the hotel has this note um, encouraging you to save the environment by hanging your towel on the rack, right? So uh, back in 1980, the environment, environmentalist Jay Westerfield found a similar sign at a hotel that he was staying in in Fiji. Um, and it said, you know, pick up this towel and, and keep it on the rack to save the environment. And ironically, this hotel that he was staying in was going through an expansion where the island's, you know, coral reefs and its, its ecosystem were being negatively affected. So Westerfield wrote an essay for a magazine using the term greenwashing to describe what he had just seen and experience, and uh, the rest is history. Um, so um, what firms like large and small must do to avoid getting embroiled, embroiled in this? So um, I guess, you know, ironically, right, uh, to avoid getting into trouble with this is not to sort of hide away from it by con trying to conceal your company's information, but actually the first step is to become transparent uh, with information. So it's really important for companies to be completely transparent about their environmental impact and disclose relevant information about their sustainability efforts. So for example, this could be about their scope one, scope two, scope three carbon emissions. It could be about the percentage of women in management positions. It can also be about the percentage of energy that's used for uh, renewable um, uh, sources, right? Um, and this information should really be accessible to the public through the company's website. It can be inaccessible through the form of an annual rep report or even a sustainability mm -hmm. report. Uh, these sources are extremely helpful for consultants like us to make an accurate analysis to, to the level at which your company is at. Um, the next step that I would like to share is to verify and to certify. So to engage with third-party organizations to verify and certify your sustainability efforts. So an example would be, uh, let's just say B Corp, right? They're a great organization that is slowly but surely building its reputation worldwide and in many parts of the world. Uh, the third is to engage with um, stakeholders um, like NGOs and MPOs and other potential partners that can provide critical advice and input on your product lines and business practices. So there's a lot of coverage. I'm sure you've seen, you've read a lot of negative coverage in the news uh, on these stories that are put out by investigative research done by such organizations. So it's kind of important for companies to turn them into your partners rather than just have them as your critics. Um, and last but not least, it's to integrate. So to integrate sustainability into your business functions. So for us, for us sustainability consultants, 
it's very, very easy to spot companies that are greenwashing. And it can be done through the organization's um, org chart um, because greenwashing companies like to sort of place their sustainability teams under the marketing division, or sometimes they're just like a little CSR team that doesn't have much influence or impact on the overall organization. So if a company is trying to take its sustainability issues seriously, it must be tied directly into its business lines and must be part of the company's mission, vision, and its long-term strategy. Really interesting. Yoshi, thank you so much for that. I mean, I re I mean really interesting. I mean, it really clear to me that companies who, who are taking this seriously, it's not just lip service. They have to get like, through the ranks from, from, from right at the top, from the board, right down to, uh, to, to the rank and file uh, you know, employees and, and through the divisions. Otherwise, there's no point. And, and it, comes like, it comes with accountability, doesn't it, as well? You have to show this in the numbers and the numbers are there. And, and people like you are going to be able to pick this out if they don't get it right. And that's going to be a problem going forward, not, not just for the company, to be honest, but also people will stop trusting, like, uh, you know, uh, the, the companies and if they don't trust the companies, then all sorts of things, you know, bad happen because the, the good ones don't get trusted either. Um, but lots to talk about. We can come maybe some of the questions in, in, uh, in, in um, at the end of the sessions. And already we're getting some really good questions in, by the way, from the audience. And I'd love to get more, so please keep them coming. Um, next up, right, we've got Emma Schuster, who uh, Emma is a, is a climate risk analyst at a nonprofit shareholder activism organization, Just Share, which advocates for corporate South Africa to use its financial and social power to drive urgent action to combat climate change and reduce inequality. Uh, Emma is an expert too on, on corporate governance, responsible investment, and the broader uh, piece of, of shareholder activism. So, welcome, Emma, uh, to our webinar. Um, and I guess I, I, I would really like to hear from you and ask you around the legal implications of, of greenwashing. How can we identify greenwashing, and what does it mean for for corporate reporting more broadly? Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's wonderful to be part of this conversation. Um, yes, as from my intro, you can tell that I'm coming from uh, the position of an activist, which means that, well, I thought I was going to say that it means that my views are sometimes maybe a bit more urgent or some might say idealistic, although what I'm hearing from others, it doesn't actually seem that way. And it's really nice to think of accountants playing an activist role in, in this process in um, identifying and calling out greenwashing. Um, in any case, in a time of crisis, um, being a bit idealistic is, is not a bad thing. Um, so about the legal stuff, um, it's not straightforward to talk about the legal consequences of greenwashing generally. At the moment, it's something that's still kind of being thrashed out in various ways through the courts, um, in parliaments, uh, the regulators. Um, but one of the definitions which comes up a lot, which we, which we see often is, um, describes greenwashing as a marketing tactic, right? Which implies that the target is consumers or users of a particular product. But it's important to make a small distinction, um, especially in the way that the, the uh, litigation plays out between that kind of marketing related greenwashing and then greenwashing that's um, intended to mislead investors and shareholders. So the marketing um, related greenwashing, there's, this is when companies brand a particular product or, or their company, but through adverts as being green in some way. And there are plenty of examples of legal actions that, have, that are um, have been taken and are just exponentially be, uh, coming to, to courts, um, either, th yeah, either through courts or through advertising authorities or consumer protection authorities. And a lot of these have led, led to some significant outcomes. So bans on, on fossil fuel adverts in public areas, um, orders to withdraw certain ads and even quite significant fines. Um, in, in, Italian, the Italian Competition Authority fined a fossil fuel company 5 million euros recently for an advert that um, said that labeled diesel as green and, say, and calling it good for the environment. I mean, it's not just fossil fuel companies. I mean, it's, it covers everything from the cases from bin liners to 
airlines, oat milk, and then even major financial institutions. So I, I'm sure some people would have heard of the complaint against HSBC recently where um, regarding its advert about protecting the Great Barrier Reef. And this one was really interesting to me because it's not really a direct misrepresentation. It's not about a green fund or a green project, but it's looking at the company as a whole and saying, well, you can't do both. You can't finance hugely environmentally destructive uh, projects or companies or industries, and then also advertise talking about protecting the environment. So those kind of claims are based on advertising or consumer protection laws. And then there's this other kind of greenwashing that it's that is intended to mislead investors and shareholders or other stakeholders like um, like the activists, which takes place kind of away from the wider consumer public. Um, it's aimed at people that read company reports, public filings, and kind of company policies, that kind of thing. And this is where um, the claims are about about having integrated ESG into business into business processes um, kind of gone a bit crazy. Um, in terms of, so there's the relationship between ESG integration and greenwashing. We like to kind of think of it as if, G, if ESG is the practice of integrating non-financial um, considerations into business practices, then greenwashing is the art of pretending to do that. And that's the kind of thing which is a little bit trickier sometimes to identify and can be quite sophisticated. So just for example, a major South African bank a year or two ago released a fossil fuel financing policy. And in it are all kinds of broad statements about commitment to the just transition, commitment to the Paris goals. But there are no real short or medium term commitments, no strategies or targets that would give substance to those broad commitments, those broad claims. And it also talks about the importance of gas as a transition fuel and the role of gas um, in developing Africa, despite significant evidence now that um, gas is neither least cost nor quickest um, nor the best way to address energy insecurity on the continent. So they've got this policy and then as a result, the time comes for the company to produce its annual report on its emissions profile. And we see that the bank has actually increased its financing of fossil fuels over that period, which it's, as it reports is in line with its, with its fossil fuel policy. And factually that's true, but the policy has, in this case has done nothing but provide kind of a veneer or a pretense that the company is doing something about climate change while it just continues with its business as usual, which is direct financing of fossil fuels. And this kind of greenwashing is also facing legal consequences. Now there are cases that are based on security fraud. That, that's the claim. And this is a significantly, a potentially much heavier and more significant consequence um, that can bring in direct liability of individual directors, including jail terms. Now, that hasn't happened yet, but it's fully possible within, within these kinds of um, cases and in, in other examples. And there are, so the, like the direct liability for directors hasn't happened, but there are cases based on this kind of um, claims. So there's the case of DWS last year, which was quite a high profile one in which um, the German law enforcement publicly raided the offices of Deutsche Bank and DWS, purely on the basis that they had evidence that the company was not taking ESG factors into account, despite proclaiming that um, its products were green and sustainable. And then finally, just outside of the courts, um, there's also big movements within government regulators, uh, particularly in financial conduct authorities um, that are starting to crack down on greenwashing. Uh, the UK and the US, both of their major um, securities exchange authorities have made really big uh, pronouncements and uh, strides in this area. In the UK, uh, a new law will see penalties of up to 10% of global turnover for breaches of consumer law. That's a significant uh, amount for a major multinational corporation. And even individuals uh, who breach these laws can face fines up to 300,000 pounds. 
And then finally, in the in the EU, I think most people will know about the European Commission's recent last month published a proposal for a new directive, which is um, called the Green Claims Directive. And it's a pretty comprehensive proposal that aims to ensure kind of transparent communication and proper substantiation of environmental claims. Um, I have to say that in the time between a, a kind of an announcement like this and implementation, there's a lot of lobbying that goes on. So what it ends up being may, may be different, but the tide is not going to is not going to change. You know, this is the direction that the law is taking. So yeah, just uh, to end, I'll say that these conversations about like how to identify and avoid it are really important. Um, but in truth, companies just need to be on board with the fundamental, the deeper, deeper, on a deeper level, the reality of the issues. So with climate related claims, that means, you know, understanding the urgency, understanding the impacts, understanding what needs to be done, and then aligning strategies and um, plans with that, in which case greenwashing won't be necessary and nor would it be to, to avoid it. But um, as Michael said in his, in his introduction, um, this is obviously where accountants and other professionals play such an important role. So I will leave it there, thanks. Thank you, uh, Emma. Thank you so much. I mean, that's such a comprehensive uh, overview of all the different rating tree pushes. And as you say, uh, it, it, it's you know to so, to an extent only the beginning, isn't it? Right. So this is this is the direction of travel. It's going to get tighter, and uh, companies are going to feel more and more under pressure from regulators to do it, even if they're not doing it themselves for whatever reason. Uh, and some great examples. I think many people will be familiar with the HSBC uh, example, particularly. Here in the UK, uh, a lot of the big oil companies are getting you know, lots of pressure as well from activists. Uh, and we're seeing shareholder activism as well, aren't we? Which is kind of interesting. Like, this is like starting to become a financial shareholder issue where people are you know, entering the, the, the shareholder base and using their, uh, their stakes as, as, as means to, um, to drive change as well. And before we move on, I, I, there's, there's one quick, quick question which has come from the floor. And I, I do want to ask you about it just because I think it's perhaps the other side of the coin to some degree. Um, and, and, the, and this is a question from, from, from one of our, our, our viewers. Uh, it is how can, we, how can we prevent regulation and uh, the fear of, of negative reputational risks resulting in, uh, in green hushing? And the green hushing, I'm sure, is something you're familiar with, uh, which is when companies are too scared almost to make claims. And it would be good if, if you have a, have a sort of a, a better uh, the definition than that, uh, but that is that is what I would say. Um, so, what do you think about that? Do you think, do you think green hushing is a, is a real risk on the on the flip side of this? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a it's a good term. I actually haven't heard that particular term before, but um, I think that as I just sort of said earlier, the um, honest reporting is really all that's needed, you know, and I can't imagine that the legislation in general due to like lobbying and, and whatever is generally less uh, prescriptive. So I don't know, I haven't seen examples of, of uh, this happening, of uh, corporates holding back on their green claims. Um, I think put in the proper context in their reports. I think one of, one of the things that uh, happens, especially around sustainable finance reporting, is, um, is that you know com companies will report on the number, so the dollar amount that they've invested into sustainable finance, uh, which most people are not comfortable really with numbers, and so it looks like a lot. Um, but put in context, it may mean, you know, only a, a small percentage of the portfolio. I just think that um, kind of, as Yashi said, the more information, the more transparency, the better people need to understand what, what the company is doing so that they can make informed decisions. Um, yeah, I think an intention to frame anything in a particular way can get you in trouble, but as much information and put in its proper context, I can't see why the regulation should have that that um, perverse effect. 
Yeah, yeah. No, well, fantastic. Thank you for Chris, get your, your thoughts on that. And uh, and again, thank you for, for your earlier your, uh, early address as well. Really, really interesting. Um, and, and some of these uh, points I'm sure our next guest actually might be able to elaborate on. So I'd now like to introduce uh, Aisling uh, McCaffrey. Uh, McCaffrey. Uh, Aisling is the director of the, of the Financial Services Consulting Department of Grant Thornton, specialising in sustainability. Aisling has over 10 years experience in the financial services sector, working with key clients across Europe on a range of projects covering business strategy, risk management and sustainability advisory. Uh, so Aisling, uh, what role do you think uh, can chartered accountants play in spotting and preventing greenwashing? Great. Thanks, Dan. And, and thanks, everybody. It's been a I think, great discussion so far in terms of setting the scene and, and a bit of context as to what we're talking about in terms of in terms of greenwashing. So I think, look, from a chartered accountant's perspective, um, I think Michael and Kate definitely uh, covered it off there in, in terms of, um, you know, we're, I guess, trusted advisors to, to businesses across a range of industries. And really we have a key role to play in 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 a number of ways i guess um when we're looking at aspects of greenwashing and and reporting um as charities accountants you know we cover a variety of roles um if i were to look at kind of the audit insurance um side of the house um at the moment you know there are some requirements in terms of sustainability reporting most of it is kind of limited assurance limited to larger um companies but there is with the kind of increasing regulation specifically if we were looking at a European context with um, CSRD the corporate sustainability reporting directive that's coming down the track that's bringing into scope like a large number of um, of European businesses um, with enhanced sustainability reporting requirements and mandatory assurance. So that's that's a big step forward in terms of kind of that reporting requirement and the role that we as accountants would have to play in being able to um, provide that assurance, carry out those audit requirements. I think it's brought in, you know, a, a, a huge amount more. Um, the, the, ex, the bar has been raised in terms of the expectation um, for like technical expertise to be able to, to deliver on that um, and requirements around that. So I think that's pretty interesting in terms of um, the support role that we need to play there and our role in kind of um, bringing those disclosures through given that assurance. Um, I think the general idea as kind of Emma touched on as well is we, we want the the legislation and the directives that are coming into place it is with the you know with the um, aim of increasing transparency I guess is the key the key piece and comparability from a from a user standpoint as well so there is a piece about um being able to set up kind of robust processes around that to kind of enable that transparency of information I think from my side of the house, I sit more on the advisory side and less on less on the audit side uh, for my sins. Um, and I think, you know, there's a number of us in, in those roles as well as chartered accountants. Um, and from my perspective, the work that I would be doing with clients is around building out um, the requirements for, for those disclosures, um, whether it's voluntary or mandatory. And a lot of it is focused around, you know, looking at um, the requirements, interpreting or the requirements, looking at a kind of assessment of what they have available and helping build out those structures in terms of like a data strategy and a, a data dictionary. Data is kind of the key piece that underpins a lot of this, especially when we're talking about transparency and, and you know, where you're reporting outward on one specific number, but ensuring that there is a, you know, there's a key kind of um, consistency behind that in terms of how you get to that number. And what I'm seeing in terms of the integration into financial reporting, um, I've been looking at some of the Pillar 3 reports um, from a European banking context, um, and there's lots of uh, new information flowing through there on ESG risk, probably the first time we're starting to see that level of information in terms of, um, uh, you know, that portfolio view that Emma's is referring to, um, where you can see in context uh, the volume of lending that's being done by banks across um, kind of high carbon emitting sectors. So I think that's like a really big step forward in, in promoting that kind of transparency and compa comparability element. And I think 
we as chartered accountants being in those roles where we're working with those clients, whether it's in financial services or or in industry to to prepare um, some of those disclosure requirements and look at how they're integrating that risk into their business. Like we have a massive role to play there, I think, um, in, in enabling that kind of move forward um, into 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 an environment where we just have access to much better um, information. Um, and I think that's based on kind of our skill set from being able to look at, for example, um, the overlap of the financial requirements, let's say financial reporting requirements and being able to interpret those um, whilst also being able to, um, I guess, apply apply a certain level of logic and, and interrogation. So that's where I see that really us having a key role is that level of kind of rigor um, and robustness around processes and procedures that sits on the audit side of the house but also in a similar vein when we're in advisory capacity that's the type of thing that we're looking to to integrate is really those um the processes and procedures behind everything so that you can essentially get ownership sign off and people are comfortable over figures um because I guess like the key call out is that some of this is a journey um, and just reference to that piece around green hushing um I, I can see why having been on the ground with clients, I can see why that is a thing um, because a lot of the regulation is coming through. Um, if I was to take that pillar three as an example, it's coming through at pace. So just the level of kind of travel that that needs to go through internally for people to understand what those numbers mean. So all of a sudden we go from having one figure that talks about green lending or sustainable lending to now we're suddenly talking about what percentage of our portfolio is tied to kind of high carbon emitting sectors as defined by, you know, this uh, this pillar three template. Um, and we haven't seen necessarily seen that information before. And it looks like a balance sheet it looks it's it's in the same style as other kind of financial um, reporting disclosures. So there's a bit of a journey that has to travel internally for people to get comfortable around OK, what does this actually mean? These numbers that I'm I'm putting out there, how do I interpret that right up to kind of board level? So I do think that's part of the the kind of the pace of change. And um, there, there is a piece around people wanting to take a conservative view in terms of how they come to um, the, the answer, for example, when they have to. Um, do approximations and estimations less so about what are you lending into green obviously you should you should you should know that but when we're looking at energy efficiency of portfolios and um, for example with a bank and their mortgage book and um, it's it's trying to find that balance of the data that's readily available versus plugging the gaps with uh, a logic that and a methodology that people can stand over or slash not disclosing at all because you don't have the information. So there's a there's a balance around, I guess, all of that. Um, and I feel like us as chartered accountants can kind of sit in the middle of that to help kind of guide the process, give direction on, on you know, what's um, applicable or not, but also working with our, I have to say, working with our colleagues in terms of that layering in technical expertise when it comes to some of these metrics and how to interpret them as well. Um, so yeah, so I think um, lots of opportunities um, as chartered accountants, uh, lots of assurance requirements coming down the line that I will be uh, probably steering clear of in my advisory capacity. But um, uh, yeah, it's um, I think I think it's it's going to be um, a very interesting time in the next uh, eighteen to twenty four months um, for for our industry. Well, in fact, yeah, absolutely. I mean, really clear how how important the uh, accountants will be both on advisory and the audit side. Clearly. Um, and you know, you must have seen your own business uh, in this area just absolutely take off in the last ten years. You've been, you've been working with it. Um, I mean, just one, one question has come from the, the audience, and I thought it'd be really good to get your thoughts on. Um, uh, it's basically, so, uh, and it comes to, to to an extent how the pillar three uh, requirements yeah. will work, which is not directly within the relation of. of of the company, but outside and the supply chain and so on. Um, but the, the question is, uh, how can chartered accountants play their role in addressing greenwashing when it's beyond the corporate level? which is typically the scope that the a ACAs have influence over, i.e., in this, in this question, a, gre a greenwashing at the level of e uh, ESG rating companies, which is beyond what a typical accountant would be able to actually see. I mean, is there, is there anything they can do? Um, I think it depends on, I think it depends on the role you play. So, like, to be fair, in, in where I'm positioned at the moment from a, like, consulting and advisory perspective, 
there is a piece where you get access to that information from say if I'm supporting a client in terms of like not to get into the weeds of it but if they're trying to establish um you know information on their portfolio to disclose outwards then there is a piece about challenging how you get that information and where it's coming from and the reliance upon that in terms of like the ESG rating companies and and things like that so I think there's probably an element of that 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 kind of feed through coming from a client side and and trying to you know challenge reliance on external like the the third party piece is absolutely massive like I think the reality is we have big data gaps that need to be filled. There is a role for kind of third party providers to play there. But but in the same sense, there is a need for a huge amount of kind of robustness and governance around what you rely on and, and how, like your ability to rely on that third party to supplement, you know, kind of your information. So I think like, like we kind of fit in within that bracket of helping kind of challenge um the usability of some of that information maybe i don't know if that answers the question but yeah no, and absolutely and i think it's that saying which obviously regulators are very uh, cognizant of as well so you know lots of scrutiny on on on, on those third parties uh, but thank you very much for that fascinating to hear things from your perspective uh, and what the county profession can do uh it's definitely greenwashing if you more questions are coming in so maybe we'll come back to them if we have time um but before we move to our next guest i'd like to go back to our polling for the audience uh so please, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get the poll question back up on screen. And this one relates to education and training, uh, something which is a, a key uh, issue, uh, we think. Um, the question is, do you think greenwashing should be incorporated into uh, the relevant educational levels? Uh, and the answer is either yes, but only in relevant subjects at university level. Yes, it should be taught at school because it will affect us all. Or no, it is not important at an educational level. Um, and, and, and while we uh, get in the, the, your responses, while well, you have to think about that, I'll introduce our final guest this afternoon, who is Elena Marginanu, uh, who is a, a PhD holder and lecturer at the Free International University of Moldova, ULIM, where she teaches an introductory course in environmental law for second year students. Prior to this, Elena worked as an environmental impact assessment evaluator at the Solidarity Fund PL. Um, so, uh, you know, we're getting some of the results in, Elena, but I, I mean, really good to get your, your, your sense as, uh, as an educator, uh, really about, about how, how important, you know, producing greenwashing uh, 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 as a requirement in schools and universities, how important that all is. I mean, the, just looking at the numbers, um, it's pretty clear that was everyone that we have uh, joining us today, 84%, uh, think it should be taught at school at a level, uh, which is right, right at the start of people's uh, uh, journey, because it will affect us all. So it would be great to get your views on, on, on those numbers, um, you know, because many, many schools don't talk about this, many companies don't train around this. Uh, 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 so what do you, what do you think, Ellen? What, what's, it, what's, what's this telling us? Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to bring a voice from East Europe and academia at this webinar. It is a great honor. I would like to point two moments in my brief intervention and then conclude to the answer at your question. And the first point is what makes a company legally liable. And the second point is the asymmetric rigidity in the promotion of certain green uh, measures. And you'll understand then in a second why this is interesting. So the first thing, what makes a company legally liable? Today we are talking about greenwashing, but any phenomenon is legally handled by two means. A, positive measures, tax benefits, classification of special legal categories, and anything that would encourage certain actions. And B, negative measures like sanctions. So when we look at how a company would avoid greenwashing or be held accountable, we must look at its alignment with national regulations and not at public policy documents. Because public policy documents and recommendation documents, even from international institutions, they have no legal binding force unless it's reflected in national regulation and unless the company itself is engaged in specific contracts. Whereas the national regulation do have an existing legal binding force with emergent sanctions because sanctions always emerge from national regulation. 
And at alignment with the regulation, we look mainly at the process. In here, the burden is on state uh, because the state enforcement bodies as local public authorities is entitled to perform state control and check whether the company has all the environmental authorizations or not. Basically, environmental authorizations is the core of legal accountability. And on the other hand, we have the product and here the companies uh, truly do have the freedom to use any package they want as long as its description corresponds with the description from the company's internal documents. For example, it can be written 100% biodegradable on the package and that's all. However, they don't put on the label that biodegradable is only if discharged in the right condition. So on one hand, we have the lack of informational context and from another, we have the written description that can be proven as correct if taken further. Thus, the burden is heavier on the consumer side as the consumer should evaluate if the first impression of the product corresponds logically with the presented information. So yes, the consumer protection can be included in the education process, but only and only if it is treated multidimensionally. And here I would like to go to my favorite second point, which will make you understand why analysis in education process is very important. So my second point, which I insist on mentioning, is the asymmetric rigidity in promoted measures. I'm sure some of you have never heard this information before. Precisely the carbon issue, we must admit it now, otherwise it will backfire on us quite soon. So here is how. The total carbon percentage in the atmosphere out of 100% is only 0.04%. Out of this, less than 5% is man-made, meaning less than 0.0012%. Divide this by the percentage of emissions by each country generated, and then take half of it, which is energy and transportation industry. So when IMF is proposing to rise the price of carbon tax from $3 to $75 by the end of 2030, in the context of having the business sector in European Union composed 99% of small and medium enterprises, we can expect a shockwave of bankruptcies across Europe. This is, delicately speaking, this is an inexistent threat because 0.0012% cannot drive climate change globally. And another point, when we talk about clean energy, young people often forget to look at the NASA's prediction on solar activity. Like according to NASA's forecast, the upcoming solar activity will be the weakest in the, in the last 200 years. So this means that after 2030, we might even experience a grand solar minimum in UK universities, Sweden, and I have enough research papers are talking about this. So uh, if this is true, then what? Then solar panels will be efficient like maximum 10 years more. It's solar activity. So we must start to connect the uncomfortable dots because imagine the implications. So yes, education and the capacity to connect the dots is important. My, um, my view on that is that the negative impact on the development of countries and equality completely overshadows any presumed positive impact of these measures upon the environment. This is realistically speaking. Nobody questions the local impact, but the premise that um, wants to asymmetrically increase the normative and financial rigidity is from the perspective of global climate change, which is incorrectly presented. So to conclude, in terms of education, we surely need an interdisciplinary approach, but my humble advice would be to look rather on permits associated with water, with waste, with toxicity, and less on the carbon. Yes, we must be clean, but also reasonable if we want to have an economy at all. Thank you. Right, excellent stuff. Well, thank you uh, so much, Elena, for taking us through. Uh, uh, those thoughts from a um, from a from a from an educated perspective as well as from from the Melbourne perspective, um, and just I, we, we, as always with these things, they just run very quickly. And, and before you know, you, you can almost come to an end. I do want to ask a few questions, um, and I know we've given our audience of, of you know uh, of, of young uh, and often chartered surveyors, uh, uh, we'll co we'll come back to a couple of uh, questions around that. Um, I mean, I, 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 Yoshi, I, I guess um, I guess. To, to return to you uh, very briefly, uh, uh, one of the questions we got coming in is, is what 
what can we do as individuals and as, as consumers to to uh, to you know to, to to engage with the greenwashing uh, discussion to to detect it to fight against it? I mean, what what is there as a as as you know as as individuals can we do? Thank you so much, Dan, for that really important question. Um, and oh, actually, to the audience, um, I'm going to keep my answer to this really short and simple, and it's that your pounds count, your dollars count, or your yen count. Um, so what I mean is. Uh, we actually don't go to the polls once a year. We're actually voting with our wallet every single day. And it's actually really up to us consumers that is shaping this very world that we all live in. Um, and it's really determined by the choices that we make. So, you know, please support brands that are sustainable with your wallet. Start by educating yourself, right? Can do your homework, research. Um, if there's a particular brand that you support, Take the time to read through the sustainability report, learn about certifications, like you are our biggest change maker. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Absolutely, excellent stuff. Uh, another question, uh, uh, Emma, which, which I'm gonna to come to you for. Um, uh, do, do you think that this is an area which you can see ESG assurance in having value uh, to, to ensure reported ESG data is trustworthy? And this comes to the point about ESG data, doesn't it? About whether or not people can really rely on it, uh, uh, you know, if, if ultimately the numbers that there are, are being trusted. Exactly. Yeah, um, I have a long answer to this, but I, I'll give you the short one because we have little time. But yes, um, I think undoubtedly having some assurance helps. So up until recently, it's been Wild West. Uh, companies can say really whatever they like about ESG and putting some kind of lid on that will be useful. And there are certain things that lend themselves well to assurances. Um, there are unfortunately also some, issue, some issues with it, um, some things at least to be, to be aware of. You know, how is this data audited? Uh, a lot of greenwashing happens in the strategies, in the targets, in the pronounce, in, you know, in promises and commitments. Um, which don't lend themselves to, to assurances, this kind of qualitative inf, uh, information. Um, they're also extremely complex and technical to, to be able to assess whether a company's transition plan is uh, legitimate and makes sense at all requires a, a range of, of expertise to understand. And as we know, you know, there's, there seems a proliferation of, people in ESG positions, but without necessarily having either qualifications or experiences to carry it out. So there's definitely a mismatch there in the, in the expertise of, and perhaps this will change in time, but at the moment of being able to actually give assurances on, on some of that data. Um, yeah, so, uh, I think the short answer is exactly, there are, there are some, of the quantitative stuff, which will be useful, you know, if a company says it's emitting this much uh, emissions a year, then that it's crazy that that's not currently being, you know, it hasn't been checked up until now. It will be great to have that checked, but we have to be very honest about the limitations of, of assurances over the qualitative stuff. Oh, also just to say that, you know, it depends on the data that they're given, the veracity, the extent, the, the you know, the um, integrity of the data that the that the accountants are given um, depends almost entirely on the good faith of the company providing it and or you know, other third parties. And, and frankly, we end up we're talking about greenwashing because of a failure of good faith from the corporate sector. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I actually, I'm going to end with a, a nice broad uh, question to you before, before conclu uh, concluding our remarks. Um, I mean, and it's, it's for, again, another question from, from our audience, uh, which, is, which is just, I think I, I'm gonna slightly summarize, but basically how can, how can accountants um, influence decision-making? I mean, ultimately how, you know, they, 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 you can run the numbers, you can do the audits, but how, how can you make the, the companies, uh, uh, you know, address and become more cognizant of the damage that they're doing on the environment? Uh, and indeed on people and, and the other elements of the ESG agenda. Yeah, I guess it's for me, it's that um, it, I, I was going to say value add. It's not really value add, but it really is that piece around process and being able to step out where there isn't 
like where there's a lack of transparency and really questioning when we're when you're being presented with information having comfort as to where that's been sourced from but then also help I think on the other side of the fence then being able to assist with the development um, of, of some of those kind of strategic objectives with a view to kind of looking at the integrity and, and the process around it from, from, from an assurance perspective. And whether that's, I know, like in terms of limited assurance and, and, and the robustness around that, like I do feel like it's a, mo- it's a step forward from that in terms of being able to give, you know, an audit opinion and, and being able to stand over that and given the kind of, scrutiny that that is on this at, at the moment like I just think it's there's there really is a key a key place for us to be in there um and to use our position to to kind of give that influence I guess because you're giving you're giving you know kind of your opinion and, and sign off on on um, matters that are that are being disclosed so I think that's probably coming at it from the assurance side and then same with the advisory it's really looking to to challenge um, what's being presented, ensure integrity, um, and then ultimately like use that to present back kind of whether it's alternative solutions. And, and that's, I think it's really important. Again, I mentioned it, but as Emma said, like this is hugely collaborative. Like it's not going to be one set of people that are, are solving the world's problems that you have to be bringing in a range of people with a range of skill sets. And that's, to be honest, what I find the most enjoyable about working in this space is that I get to work with people that traditionally as an accountant, I wouldn't be sitting next to, you know, somebody with a PhD in geology or, you know, that's, that's, that's talking about things that I, you know, I don't have the technical expertise in. So to me, that's, that's a key part of it is developing those kind of multidisciplinary teams so you can really look to kind of create influence I guess. Fantastic, I hope our audience has taken away a lot of interesting uh, uh, thoughts from, from that uh, from that answer uh, and, and it's very sadly I've got a, it's a nice way to end because I think it's uh, very sadly we're coming to the end of the panel discussion I always wish we could have more time uh, during these panels especially with such a fantastic group of speakers so thank you again, all of you, for your your brilliant insights. Uh, I know I've gained a huge deal from our short time together. And I hope uh, our audience uh, uh, have found the session as useful. Um, I would say that if you look at the broadcast page, there should be a link to, to uh, the definition of what is greenwashing, which is a, a very handy guide. And also we'll refer to the, the term green hushing, which I referred to earlier. Uh, and uh, and we'll probably define it in a much better way than I, I, I struggle to do so. So please do, uh, do look at some of the resources that are available uh, provided alongside this webinar. Uh, and don't forget to download your guide, which should have the key takeaways from today's session via the QR code on the screen. Uh, again, hopefully it's uh, flashing up or simply by heading to the Chartered Accountants Worldwide website. And so uh, lastly, it comes to me to say uh, a huge thank you to all our speakers today. A huge thank you uh, to you all for joining us. And a huge thank you to our partners at Big Top Multimedia and A1 for bringing this event to life. So thank you again and see you next time. That was amazing. Thank you so much, everybody.